Hey guys, so today you and I are going to talk about bad architectures and fixing them. So let's get into it. So the question in question was, hi Frederick, what do you do when a product grows so much over the years that the original architecture of it doesn't work anymore? I was tasked with building a prototype application at work that eventually evolved into an app with hundreds of thousands of lines of code. The architecture did not scale well and I was never given any time to re-architect it. Should we always approach software de development as if we were building something big and complex or is it a failure of the managers to provide us with time to re-architect and refactor as the product grows? Yes and no. Um, so. There are still things here uh, that are going on. Uh, the first thing is that uh, the whenever you're building something, just like, you never ever ever build anything, even if it's like a really simple proof of concept or something very like whatever it is. Uh, what I like to say is that there is a difference between doing sloppy and bad work for the sake of speed and making something that uh, and moving at the pace that is possible to achieve without creating a bad system. Let me try to explain that a little bit uh, because it can it might may not make sense. So uh, think about precautions in general. So for example, if you're going to I mean if you go out and you're going to go for a walk, you might wear some clothes because you know it might be cold outside. So not a lot to it, right? If you're going to go running, you're probably also just going to wear some sneakers or something to protect your feet for and so that you're able to run in a comfortable fashion. If you're going to go for a bicycle ride, you might wear a helmet. So but if you're going to ride a motorcycle, well then yeah, a more sturdy helmet is probably appropriate and you're probably going to need some protective gear or something like that if, you know, you're um, going to, I don't know, play American football or something like that, you might need whole body armor. If you're going to go to a gunfight, you might need a vest, you know, all these sorts of things. Uh, like it, You sort of scale up the level of uh, uh, security you're trying to apply in, in proportion to the thing that you're going to do. So if you're going to build a small little proof of concept system, well, if, if you're going to do that, then Sure, you might not need to write end-to-end -end tests and like bunch of unit tests and stuff like that because the system is so small or so simple that you don't really have to do that. But at the same time, you don't really have to, like, uh, which is easy for someone who might have experience to say, but uh, and this can come down to talent as well. Maybe you don't necessarily need to. Uh, well, maybe you don't really have what uh, like the ability to decide between a good solution and a bad solution. What I'm saying is that your approach to solving a problem such as a simple application and that potentially going into the future is very simple because all you really have to do is to do a good job without overdoing it because you are dividing everything up into either I do a shitty job and then I never get to re-architect re it or I need to design it from uh, perfectly from the beginning, and that's not not as I said. That, that's that's like saying that you should always wear, wear wear a life vest, or you should always wear military outfits because you could, in theory, end up in a gunfight while just walking down to the street into the supermarket, right? But it's all about probabilities and taking the the appropriate action for the moment. So when you created this application architecture that didn't really scale for you, well. If you did it in like correct in the first place, then you most likely will pay a fairly low cost in changing it in the future. But since you're in the situation where you feel like yeah, it wasn't right, and now you're forced to like continue the thing, it's very likely that the reason why you're here is due to the fact that you did not account for that this thing was going to continue growing in the future, and that is a mistake. This is the difference between MVP and hacky bad systems because most people who do MVP they start thinking hacky bad system or they create hacky bad systems because they don't actually know how to appropriate like because it's sort of like an all or nothing thing either you do everything like unit testing like the full nine yards 
or you just hack things together because it's a shit system anyway. And the truth is in the sweet spot. What I usually promote to people is to say is to say take a look at the complexity of the system and how um, like what type of restrictions you have and a approach it with the right amount of quality perspective. So if you're creating a system which is fairly sophisticated or it is a very advanced system, then you might want to have more quality. If it's a small proof of concept, you might need less quality, but you should still st follow good architecture practices. Make sure that you have linting and t you know checks for like uh, type safety if you have that, etc., etc. These smaller, simpler things. Just as I said, you should just, you know take care of your feet when you go jogging so you don't break them. Even though it's probably not as much protection as having body armor on if you wear something like that or a helmet. You could go out running with a helmet if you wanted to, but it's probably not a bit a bit, a bit much. And so the, the, because you will never be able to predict how the system is going to behave in the future. And this is the heart and soul in loose coupling. This is what loose coupling is all about. Because if you design a system that has loose coupling and has a modular approach where pieces are uh, separated in a logical and simple fashion into various domains or call it whatever you want, you can reduce the cost of rewrites and re-architecture to very like to, to something much, much more digestible because the problem is when you usually have these tightly coupled systems or these larger features that basically you know you're never ever if the cost of fixing a bad architecture is higher than the problems that they that you face or the bugs or the issues that the system has no manager is ever going to give you time to do that usually because like you it's it's something that you you've already created a situation where we simply can't fix this it's the cost is not worth it it's like um, uh, my favorite example of this is that the keyboard layout on your keyboard is suboptimal well there are tons of people who have proven with studies and so forth that there are more efficient keyboard layouts because it's modeled uh, on an inf insufficient one but the problem is that the whole world has learned this keyboard layout and re-educating the entire world to use a more efficient one is prob it's not an investment that we, our, our pro you can go and check with your politicians but they're probably not going to focus all that much on it because the cost is out outweighing the value that you're getting from it and so what i suggest to you is to approach this the same way i usually do with any system that i that i sort of need to fix it um, doesn't matter if it's legacy code or if it's bad architecture or so forth and that is to start looking at all right where do i want this thing to end up and then i create a long term plan for putting the code in a state where the cost of migration is as low as I can make it without impacting the overall deadlines. And this is the Boy Scouting rule, basically, or as I like to call it, is a Boy Scouting with a plan. You have an architecture that, you know, in a perfect world, you would just sit down and write everything in one go, but you can't. So what you do is that you talk to your teammates, you talk to everybody who's working on the project, you create a set of steps similar to you know fitness or whatever you create a plan how do we get to this state well these classes over here they're all sort of bad but they are very coupled or like they they have lots of problems so maybe we can pick some of the easier ones and put them in a nice clean art state and we'll do that every time we touch them or every time you know like somebody's touching the code that is really bad then we can make a small improvement put it in a cleaner state decouple it so that it's easier to move about within the system and then you repeat that process over and over and over and over until you hit something that you can't approach with these smaller um, bite-sized uh, improvements and then go and talk to your manager and see if they're more willing to allow you that time because now you have reduced the, uh, reduced the cost down to the bare minimum. Sometimes even that is not going to be enough but this is at least a proven, fa uh, pa proven path to get as much of the issues out the door as possible and only be in, in, in basically reducing down the problem to just dealing with like instead of dealing with like this gigantic monolithic um, uh, um, behemoth of a system that is you know basically unfeasible you can you can kill it with a thousand cuts instead of trying to kill it in like, like a, with a dragon in one blow so what I want you to take away from this is that uh, there is no way for you to know how your system is going to turn out in the end. Uh, it can be like a simple thing that never go grows beyond the thing that you're doing and you know your manager is not giving you time to re-architecture and refactor and stuff like that. This is sort of the, the, the it's the endless battle. You're never gonna 
be able to solve this one because it all comes down to your specific circumstances and what you need to achieve and that's why I tell people that if you do anything it should be, like, I mean these are my two cents on it at the very least. The first and foremost thing is whenever you're writing a system make sure that you write a good system that you have loose coupling, that you think about these sorts of good practices, but set the quality focus that you have in proportion to the system that you're dealing with. All right? At that, if you write an MVP, you don't have to set up a full like Kubernetes deployment with like super levels of testing and things like that, because it's an, a disproportionate investment for such a simple system. But you can still make sure that the system is easy to work with, that you have clean interfaces and you have clean classes or visual components or so forth. Use that talent that you have modularize thing create loose coupling so that you can add more stuff on top if it continues growing and then as it grows in complexity you can add more things like unit testing and quality and so forth you don't have to be all or nothing about the thing that's usually a better approach and then when you get to a situation where you need to re-architecture it it's easier to deal as I like to say or in my opinion it is easier to move 10 small light boxes than dealing with one really heavy fucking box that you can't basically lift. This is what people think a monolith is versus a microservices architecture, but the monolith can also be modular. Usually the modul um, the monolith problem, you really, and you can get that with microservices as well, it usually happens when everything is a spider web of dependencies and you have a bad architecture. If you have a clean architecture in a monolith, that thing will scale a long, long time before you need to start slicing it up into services. And a microservices architecture is not necessarily just better because if you have a really bad graph of network calls, you can have all kinds of problems. This is the thing I'm talking about, guys. You have to design a system that can scale at the code level. And that starts with your understanding of how to design such a system. Because when you make mistakes, and you will make mistakes, and new things will come in, then the cost of fixing that is much lower than if you made this gigantic investment. And but at the same time, you can't make the wrong, you know, this super investment to start off with. I have a story that I usually use. This is how it goes. If you're going to build a road for a small town, you could try to make a super highway on the first go. But that's probably going to be very expensive and it's probably going to require a lot of maintenance and it's probably going to be unused for the most part. It's a big investment for such a small town. You might even cripple the town's economy because of this gigantic road. So what do you do? Well, you, write, you start with a small dirt road, but it's a really good dirt road and you know that when you design it, you make sure that it can grow as the town's needs evolve. That's the mindset that you should keep with you whenever you write software. Have a great day.